Hello everybody. Um, welcome to Disability Innovation Live. Um, I can see lots of you are just joining the session now. Um, so I just want to say a big thank you for your, you all uh, coming and joining us today. Um, so on our Disability Innovation Live session today, we're going to be talking about product narratives, um, the challenges of supply and demand side barriers for Priority 80. Um, so just to give you a little information about the session, um, we have closed captions and BSL available for today. Um, closed captions, you may need to just turn on on your control systems, um, which may be at the bottom or the top of your screen normally. Um, and if you wish to use BSL, uh, BSL um, the easiest way to view that is um, to turn on gallery view. So next to the green bar at the top of your screen, um, you should be able to click to view options. Um, and then on the down menu, you'll be able to select view side by side. Um, and that function is only available on desktop, unfortunately. So if you're looking to use BSL, um, you'll need to be joining from a desktop today. Um, we very much um, would like your questions um, as we go through the session today. Um, we have the Q&A box available, um, so please do type in any questions you have as we go through the session. Um, and we've got some time towards the end of the session where we'll come to those questions and answer them in a bit more detail. Um, and we'll also try and respond as we go through as well. Um, so please do share them as you think of them. Um, after today's session, we will be providing a recording and a transcript as well. Um, so that will be available for all attendees or people that aren't able to join us today. Um, so just a little bit of information about Disability Innovation Live. Um, this is the Global Disability Innovations Hub um, monthly webinar series. Um, and we very much use it to kind of share our own knowledge and expertise and that of our partners and our friends and our colleagues across the disability innovation sector. Um, so really that's to kind of capture some of the stories behind the innovations and the people behind the products. Um, and it's a bit of an informal space for ideas and reflections um, and just to get in a bit more detail uh, around some of these really fascinating, very broad areas Areas that we're all working across. Um, so we really value your feedback. Um, we're just at the start of our, of our webinar series. This is our third, I believe now, maybe fourth. Um, and we'll continue to do them on a monthly basis moving forward as well. So just a little bit about the Global Disability Innovation Hub. We are a research and practice centre driving disability innovation for a fairer world. We are born out of the legacy of the 2012 London Paralympic Games. Um, and we are both a community interest company and also an academic research centre that's based at UCL. Um, we have programmes in 25 different countries and we're aiming to reach over 50 million people by 2022. Um, so it's just some brief kind of instructions into who we've got talking today. Um, so there's just a visual here of, of the panellists. So we have um, Catherine, Frederick, Alison, Dennis and Ben, who will be talking to you today uh, around different specific areas of the product narratives um, and the reports focused around prosthetics and eyeglasses. Um, I'll leave them to inter inter interview, introduce themselves individually as they come on to their individual sections. Um, so we'll maybe start off going to Professor Catherine Holloway, um, who's the Academic Director of the GDI Hub, just to introduce us in a little bit more detail about what the product narratives are and how they came about. Hey Louise, uh, thank you very much and thank you everybody for taking your time to join us today. I know everybody is uh, busy with uh, battling Covid and, and busy day lives. Um, so the product narratives came out of the 802030 project and I want to take a, a step back maybe and, and think about when I first heard the term product narrative. I remember I was sitting with Frey, who you'll hear from later, and he was saying the words product narrative, and I thought, I understand those words. Narrative, I understand, some kind of a story about products, I understand, I get that. And I think the same was true when I said the words assistive technology to Frey. He understood technology assists, but he didn't really know the assistive technology world. He had worked in, in other fields of healthcare technology, and I had worked in assistive technology but had never really ventured into the world of what is called market shaping and the thinking that goes into a document that is called a product narrative. So I'm delighted today to have um, Frey and, and all the rest of the team here to talk about what product narratives are and how they're gonna help inform the At Scale partnership as well as uh, partners like UNICEF. So you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so as I said earlier, it's part of the um, 802030 program and that's uh, part of what works. And so when I first heard about product narratives and market shaping as an academic, as a professor, I thought to myself, well, could that work for assistive technology? And 
I want it to work for a sense of technology, but my job is always to keep asking, does it work with everything? Do we have the evidence? Where is the data? And so I was convinced by Frey, um, and we were all convinced that this would be a good part of the programme. Um, and so we worked together to shape that programme, and, and I'm sure we would not have got the funding if it hadn't been for the wonderful partnership uh, that we brought together, um, including UNICEF and, and, of course, CHAI. So 80, 20, 30 is 20 million pounds worth of funding. It's a huge amount of funding and, and people often ask why they haven't got some of it. And the answer is that a lot of the money is going into quite uh, structural uh, work. And some of that structural work is in creating these documents called product narratives. Um, and so we hope to reach 9 million people directly and 6 million more people indirectly. So driving a lifetime of potential and more operational in 15 countries across Africa and Asia. So as I've said, the product narratives are developed by the Clinton Health Access Initiative under the UK aid funded 802030 program that's led by us at GDI Hub. And it's, we do a lot of this work on the product narratives in support of the at scale strategy. And we were GDI Hub were a founding member of the at scale um, team, and we continue to want and see its growing success. So the state of the, what we learn in product narratives, I think hopefully you'll see this if you have read them, um, they're great reads. So if you're an assistive technology expert in prosthetics, then maybe some of the prosthetics bit is really obvious to you. But if you've never, under, if you've never known anything about prosthetics or eyeglasses, then they're brilliant documents to really understand the state of the global market for each product. They give global recommendations on how to address barriers. They're focused on low and middle income countries. So where there's greatest need, and it's the first time that we've all partnered together. So we've, we've drawn together technical assistance and GDI Hub had some of it. We've also brought it in partners from like London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine. Actually, I was looking through the attendee list and lots of you have helped make these uh, documents. So thank you. Um, and it's the first time it's done on assistive technology. So, um, yeah, they are the current environment. So the, the current environment changes. We're doing the one for digital um, communication aids and things at the moment. And of course, that that uh, space changes even more rapidly. We hope that you also see this an importance um, of these documents, the value uh, to drive change, and that they look at trends across the AT products. Um, and more than anything else, I think they demonstrate the value of global partnerships and collaborations. <laughs> so um, I just wanted to bring it back. These documents are documents and in them they're very technical. And this is David. And I met David uh, four years ago in Rio. Uh, when I was lucky enough to be at the Paralympics and we, and we went to a favela and we met, we met Rio. We met David and David had uh, lost his leg by jumping off a train because he used to jump onto trains for fun and, and jump off the trains because that was apparently what he did for fun. Um, and he was a great guy, but he sort of half knew what a prosthetic was, but he had no idea of how to get one. And so, I, what the hope is for product narratives, whilst they're technical documents, is that they help people like David get the legs they need to be even better footballers than he already is, because he's actually incredibly good. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Frey, I believe, um, and um, I hope that you enjoy the rest of this conversation. Please do make it a conversation. To, uh, drop questions in. We're very open to answering them. I can help with some of the technical ones, um, prosthetics, and not at all on eyeglasses and hearing aids. Brilliant. Thank you very much, um, Kathy. Really interesting just to hear that introduction and also just to get that kind of individual story looking a little bit more, I guess, about the bigger picture here that kind of is helping individual people and getting the assistive technology to those that, that need it most and currently don't have access. Um, so I'll now hand across to Frey just to give us a bit, bit more information um, who's based at the Clinton Health Access Initiative. Perfect. Thank you very much, Louise. And uh... Perhaps by means of introduction, um, for those of you that don't know uh, Clinton Health Access Initiative or CHAI, in the first place, we are a, a global health organization and our commitment is towards uh, saving life and, uh, lives and reducing the burden of disease in low and middle income countries. Uh, and we operate, uh, or we do that by operating in 35 countries worldwide at the service of governments, uh, helping to strengthen the capabilities of the government as well as the private sector to create systems that can sustain without or continue the system. So that is uh, primarily what we do. Now, it obviously triggers the question, why did we help develop uh, those narratives in the first place? Why did we take that on? And as Kathy explained earlier, um, Chai's partnered with a variety of, of donors, including the, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office to increase access 
uh, and lowered the prices for several commodities, including HIV medications and contraceptives. And based on that work, we were asked to help assess if and how that type of work could also be replicated in assistive technology. And in terms of the scope, uh, because assistive technology covers such a broad number of products, um, in consultation with, um, with different founding partners of AT Scale, from which we'll hear later on, um, five products, assistive products were prioritized for a deeper dive under the AT2030 program, um, uh, including these are wheelchairs, hearing aids, prostheses, eyeglasses, and digital devices. And uh, in case you were wondering, the name Narrative was actually inspired by uh, Unitate, a uh, global health initiative, um, who regularly publish and update uh, reports on the state and disease areas that they support. So that's just where that name narrative comes from. Um, what are the objectives? Well, each report is aimed at providing global stakeholders with a perspective on four things. First, what is the current state of the sector and relevant market context for a product area in low and middle income countries? Second, what are the key challenges and barriers that inhibit access? Third, what are some high level objectives to overcome those barriers and help drive availability and affordability? And last, what are early opportunities to accelerate access to specific products. In terms of the, the primary audience, um, the reports are obviously intended to, to all stakeholders, um, including interested funders, uh, as well as uh, implementing partners, private sector, but also country governments, uh, anyone that, that is seeking to be informed about the sector and seeking to align programs and activities. Uh, in terms of how these narratives were developed, so the reports are actually a synthesis of uh, an analysis that uh, took us between four and six months. And there were different components of that analysis. Uh, there was a big proportion was desktop research. There were calls with experts and key opinion leaders, with NGOs, with disabled persons organizations and user groups, with buyers and with suppliers amongst others. And I know I want to recognize that many of you have been involved and supported and contributed to the, in this process in one of the product areas. In addition, there's also been on the ground data gathering that we've done in several countries uh, in different regions of the world. Um, I want to acknowledge also the fact that the process involved the technical expertise that was provided to us from the GDI hub and several experts, including uh, I think everyone representing on this panel today, was involved in the review of the reports before publication. Um, I want to note just a few things um, when people read those reports. Obviously, experiences and opinions differ, and these reports are not meant to be consensus papers, but rather try to document different perspectives and make different observations. Second, the reports are not capturing every detail or necessarily capture every stakeholder's perspective. Um, and uh, perhaps there might be opportunities to add that later on, but they're primarily meant to provide a directional output on what needs to be done and set a common direction. Last, the primary purpose is to direct future work and be actionable. Now, um, in terms of some of the general observations, um, there's a couple of cross-cutting themes or themes that are common uh, across those, those narratives. Um, obviously, the first one is the, the limitation, a limited involvement from governments, suggesting a need to support governments to develop comprehensive policies and plans in order to deliver the services and the products in a way that is sustainable. I think the second piece is linked to the the, to the question that we put ourselves forward in terms of can market shaping also be taken into this area? And um, we have the, looked at the interventions and they suggest 
that there is possibility to also increase, improve affordability and availability uh, through market shaping in low and middle income countries. And last, uh, as resources and limited our effort, uh, our uh, resources and efforts are limited, um, the uh, stakeholders, including donors, should come together under a unified approach to support the effort. So this is meant to be a first step in a consultative process to build broader support across different partners, suppliers, and donors, governments, and user groups, of which some will speak uh, after me. So I hope that was a, a help to give some a context to these documents. I hand back over to you, Louise. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Ray. I think that's really interesting, um, very much just in terms of looking at that bigger picture. And I think what you really kind of clearly highlighted there is that importance for sustainability, but also that need for a unified approach. And I think that's really where these, um, these documents and the product narratives um, take the sector in, in, into a new space and, and into something that, that is, is very collaborative and brings together a lot of the global work um, that has maybe been happening in, in silo. Um, to enable us all to work together a, a little bit better and to, to, to kind of as one have more power and influence, um, particularly on, on things as you mentioned around kind of policy and, and planning at a, at a higher kind of governmental level as well. Um, so it's really, really fascinating to hear that. So I'm now going to hand across to Alison um, from uh, At Scale, who's going to give us just a little bit more kind of, I guess, I guess, detail around what happens next and what's the kind of longer term vision for some of these kind of reports and the outputs from them. Great. Thank you so much for the introduction, Louise, and to GDI Hub for the opportunity to participate on behalf of AT Scale today. Um, AT Scale, the Global Partnership for Assistive Technology, is a, a cross-sector partnership bringing together bilateral donors, UN organizations, uh, disabled persons organizations, non-governmental organizations, governments of low and middle income countries, uh, to address the gap in access to affordable, appropriate, and quality assistive products and services, particularly for low and middle income countries, as we've heard about already. Um, and as you heard, we have um, a number of our founding partners uh, on this panel. So GDI Hub, CHAI, and UNICEF um, are, are three of our, our 11 founding partners. And we've set an ambitious goal of catalyzing action to ensure that 500 million more people globally are reached with life-changing assistive technology by 2030. And we have two primary strategic objectives guiding our work. Um, so first, we want to develop the enabling ecosystem for increased access to assistive technology. And, and when I say the, the enabling ecosystem, this involves increasing political will and focus on this work, mobilizing additional resources, addressing the policy landscape, and then strengthening the necessary cross-cutting systems for assistive technology, particularly at a country level. And then secondly, we're going to take a market building and market shaping approach, focus both on the demand and the supply level, um, with an initial focus on um, the five party products and related services that Frey uh, highlighted in his, in his talk. Um, and in line with the second objective, the product narratives of these market and sector analyses that we started to hear about are, are really critical because they identify the initial key barriers that we need to overcome to ensure that we're investing in the most necessary interventions to strengthen the market and the systems um, to accelerate access to these products and services. So each product narrative includes um, strategic objectives and some initial interventions that can be implemented. And then these are elaborated into what um, we're calling uh, action and investment plans, illuminating more of the specific interventions and investments that are needed. And AT Scale will fund a number of these interventions directly. And our objective is for the plans to guide implementation and investment by others also as we move forward together to improve access to assistive technology. Um, next slide, please. Um, and building on what um, Frey highlighted a bit in his um, section as well, there are common themes emerging from the product narratives. And many of these, um, as I said, will be uh, areas for investment early on, um, such as the need for improved data and research standards, global guidance on how um, countries can select um, the right appropriate products and, and also a guidance on what service delivery might look like for these products, development of more affordable and appropriate assistive 
products uh, specific for the different contexts that we're talking about, but also innovative screening tools and service delivery models that can reduce the cost of provisions. And we'll be thinking about reducing the cost of products, but also reducing how uh, the cost of how these products are provided. Um, and further, I think there's a very strong need for integration of these products and services into government systems, as well as increased government ownership and resourcing as well of these programs. Um, just to say, we've focused on um, five priority products initially, um, and these were selected because of the global need as well as the potential for applying market shaping approaches. So we of course recognize that there are many assistive products critical for improving individuals' lives globally. Um, so we're confident that investing in the interventions that are emerging from these product narratives will not only improve the markets and uh, systems for these products, but will also enable improvement of the broader integrated systems for AT, thus having an impact um, across the broader range of important assistive technology. Um, I think as you, as you read, hopefully, these uh, product narratives, you'll also hear the um, importance uh, that is put placed on the fact that implementation of market shaping and programmatic efforts is not meant to be taken on by one actor, but it's going to require partnership and coordination across all of us. Um, and so we see a real opportunity to use these uh, product narratives and the resulting action plans to move forward towards a unified strategy um, for all of us uh, working within the sector. So we look forward um, as AT Scale um, in working with many of you uh, on this call um, in multiple ways. So I think many of you will implement many of these interventions. We'll also look forward to continuing to um, hear lessons learned from your work and your lived experiences. And I know that all of us on this panel will want to engage, um, engage you to support us in continuing to refine the plans for action and investment as they become sector-wide strategies towards increasing access um, to this affordable and appropriate quality assistive technology. So thanks so much um, for joining this really important conversation. Thank you, Alison. Um, I think what comes across to me really strongly there is about the fact that we're almost at the start of the journey and these kind of product narratives are a, are, are a really interesting point um, to be taken forward, as you say, as, as a group, as a whole, as, as, as the kind of assistive technology world, um, working together to then kind of drive forward this implementation and, and start developing some of those kind of hugely broad and, and complex areas that you mentioned around service delivery, around kind of appropriate um, availability of assistance and other technologies around reducing costs. Um, it's certainly a huge area, but it's, I think it's a really exciting time and it really gives, I guess, a, a foundation for us all to kind of build upon. And it will be very interesting to see where we get to in the, in the next couple of years as these, um, as these documents and as the strategy that comes from them um, moves forward and, and becomes kind of implemented on a, on a wider country, but also kind of international scale as well. Um, so certainly one to watch. Um, so I'm now going to hand across to Dennis, who's just going to give us a little bit more detail um, specifically on the, um, on the eyeglasses um, product narrative report. Um, so Dennis, I'll hand across to you to introduce yourself. Thank you. Um, hi everyone and thank you GDI for inviting me to, uh, to join this panel. Uh, I'm going to take you on a whirlwind tour of the uh, eyeglasses narrative just to um, show the, the highlights. But before I go through way too many slides, I just want to take a minute um, to address why, what, how UNICEF intends to use these product narratives. Um, for us, uh, the five product narratives is uh, an excellent way of gaining a, a, a first-hand market overview of these uh, different product categories uh, that shows us how we as a headquarters division can better support our 160 country offices around the world, uh, both programmatically and technically. Uh, when it comes to these product groups. It's also a way for us to decide whether UNICEF should play a stronger procurement role uh, on these um, five product areas. Today, UNICEF procures for around three and a half to four billion US dollars a year. Not a lot on AT, um, but these uh, narratives is sort of our first step into this to see whether we should, should and could play a role in this area as well. Having said that, uh, I've been asked to introduce the eyeglass narratives, so, um, so I'll go through the highlights. Next slide, please. 
Firstly, eyeglasses represent the biggest need for 180. It's about 2.2 billion, actually probably a little bit more uh, that have one or more vision impairment or blindness that needs um, eyeglasses. Uh, what is important uh, or what, is, what stands out to me is the need uh, really is concentrated in LMIC countries, especially low income countries. And it has significant economic consequences when vision impairment goes uncorrected. Next slide, please. There are a lot of barriers uh, to access for, for eyeglasses, low awareness and low accept acceptance, uh, stigma in general. Uh, there's uh, in many countries a high cost for the end user to get the product, uh, the service delivery models, the in-country service delivery models, um, are quite resource heavy, both on the requirements of infrastructure and on the requirements of trained staff. Um, and very importantly, um, eyeglasses and 18 general experience a low uh, level of uh, investment and priority by governments. Next slide, please. This one shows um, the correlation between corrected and uncorrected pressed biopia by region. And what I really wanted to highlight is the third column, which shows the difference from high income countries uh, to other regions or to regions in general. Um, so obviously, Sub-Saharan and South Asia really stands out as uh, regions with the high uh, concentrations of uncorrected press biopia. Next slide, please. Um, this sort of also shows regional differences and age differences in the uh, most common reflective um, uh, vision impairments, so uh, myopia and presbyopia. Uh, the thing for me that sticks, that sticks out and that I highlight is um, the differences in age groups, which is of obviously of important to the UNICEF mandate and myopia is the most common refractive error for children. Uh, so it's estimated that about 312 million children suffer from this worldwide. Next slide, please. Negative effects from lack of access to eye care. Uh, so I'm gonna go through the, the main uh, items in the report. So one is a high productivity loss, which we already saw uh, in the first slide. Uh, it uh, has an impact on global economy on around uh, 270 billion US dollars. Next slide, please. Um, there's also a factor, such other factors, such as for instance, roadside accidents. Uh, so there are some examples from India and the UK, also both on what it means for life, security, but also um, societal costs. Next slide, please. Very importantly, um, uncorrected vision impairments uh, have a high impact on the quality of life. Uh, it, studies show that vision persons with vision impairments have a higher risk of depression, anxiety, and social isolation. Um, and the social isolation of, can often lead to cognitive decline as well. Uh, low education is also something that we are very aware of at UNICEF and something that we um, strongly combat uh, through our country offices and vision impairments, one um, very important uh, route to, to um, lower education outcomes. Next slide, please. So there are five strategic goals mentioned. Uh, one is to mobilize key stakeholders, including donors, multilateral NGOs, um, strengthen go global policy guidance uh, and delivery standards, including um, access to new uh, types of products and deliveries, so service deliveries, uh, support the governments uh, in creating comprehensive eye care plans, engage the private sector and build and drive awareness around consumer demand for eyeglasses. The report also highlights um, a few new technologies that could be interesting to look at for um, better service delivery or cheaper service delivery. One is smartphone-based uh, visual acuity tests. You can read a lot more about it in the narrative, uh, but it's an interesting way of using smartphones to easy access. Um, one is handheld, easy to use refraction devices. The important thing about this is it's a device that requires minimal training for staff. Uh, so it's easier to access without the heavy resource requirement of trained staff. Um, photo screeners using cameras to estimate the refractive error. Next slide, please. And self-refraction devices integrated into the delivery of eyeglasses. So this is something introduced by Global Vision 2020. Um, 
The next step of the um, of the narrative is uh, one for implementation for, to do an implementation strategy developed by UK funded AT2030, so GDI Hub. Um, the uh, narrative is also, as uh, Alison already mentioned, being used by AdScale to um, help us inform our investment strategies, uh, so both in the short and the long term, um, and finally drive large-scale investments and financial instruments to achieve long-term outcomes, also through AdScale. So just concluding quickly before I hand back to, um, to, to Louise, um, obviously the narratives it will also have a huge impact on how a UN generally looks on this. So both WHO and UNICEF will use the narratives to uh, inform our decision making within these five product groups. So we thank uh, GDI Hub and Chai for the great work that's been done on the narratives. Over to you, Louise. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dennis. I think that's a really interesting snapshot, I guess, just at the scale of the challenge. Um, and, and what an impact it can make and actually how we can use technology to really drive forward um, in a lot of these areas. Um, I think what also really came to mind is kind of from the kind of um, product narrative report was that the, the kind of number of people requiring kind of eyeglasses is, is increasing um, and that actually the, the, the impact of stigma and awareness as well that, that feeds into that. So I think it's a, it's a really interesting area and certainly something that, um, that will be fascinating to see how, how that develops and actually how technology plays such a crucial role in, um, in enabling greater access to that particular assistive technology um, on a wider scale. Um, so we're next going to come to um, Ben. Um, I'll leave Ben to introduce himself in a little bit more detail. He's going to talk through um, some of the prosthetics findings. Great, thanks, Louise. So I'm uh, Dr. Ben Oldry. So I'm a research fellow at uh, between Global Disability Innovation Hub and um, the Institute of Making at UCL, working on 802030. Um, so, yeah, next slide, please. Stop the tour of uh, the prosthetics uh, product narrative. If we go to, yeah, next slide, thanks. So, globally, um, there's um, an estimated 65 million people that live with amputations. Um, when done adequately, um, you know, this, uh, yeah, prosthet prosthesis provision can improve the quality of life, um, but only 5 to 15 percent of people in LMICs that could have one have access. Um, and we Project that this global need is going to double by 2050. Um, you can see here that there's there's a wide range of uh, prosthetic devices uh, available. Um, could we go? Could we go back? Sorry. Thanks. Sorry. Yeah. So I'm just going to state that the um, the this prosthetic uh, this uh, product narrative uh, we're focusing on lower limb prosthesis because uh, we could see that uh, the majority um, of amputations globally in, in various regions are of lower limb. But we hope that uh, a lot of the conclusions that we're drawing here can be applied to um, upper limb prosthetics. Thanks very much. Can we carry on? Great. So we can see that there's um, there's yeah we know there's a there's a wide range of devices available. Um, ranging from um, very basic types up to more higher end um, intelligent devices. Um, but what's true to all of them is that they require trained and accredited prosthetists um, and the wider skill sets around them, such as OTs and physical therapists, um, to provide a good service delivery. Um, unfortunately, there's a severe lack of these in LMICs. Um, there is some donor funding, but it is limited and historically it's been prioritised for the training of prosthetists trying to address this capacity issue. Um, next slide, please. So the global market is dominated by a few key companies and they do focus on high income settings and the higher end of products. Um, unfortunately, the, the LMIC market is small and one of the reasons for this um, is this lack of capacity that's found there. Um, one of the reasons for this is that uh, there's a Current lack of governmental input, um, which leads to non-profits, uh, so NGOs, um, charities, um, faith-based organisations, which have very strong presence in some countries, and these dominate the provision services. Um, one way so we can we can be improving the situation um, is if we could be developing collaborations between the public sector and for-profit business, um, and look, looking to expand access to devices globally. Um, a barrier to this is that just the lack of data. Um, if we could be improving the amount of data on amputees and uh, 
aspects around amputation, um, this could help to improve advocacy and it could drive investment. Investors aren't going to invest in things if there isn't evidence for there being a market in the first place. Um, and this would improve the quality of care that could be given out. Next slide, please. So another problem we see is that there's poor referral pathways um, from amputation service uh, to rehabilitation services. Um, and this leads to, to patient drop off. Um, a lot of this is around just low awareness of what services are available for, across teams. Um, fortunately, when referred, these services can be quite costly to the users and often very far away. They're concentrated in urban settings. And if people are from a rural setting, then that journey could be both long and very difficult. One thing that could help here is decentralization. Um, decentralization efforts are currently focused on pre and post fitting rather than the actual fitting process itself. Um, and we'd like to see investigation into the cost effectiveness um, to justify um, increasing these endeavors. Um, one thing that could help with uh, decentralization is a variety of innovative socket fabrication, such as uh, direct casting and digital fabrication, like 3D printing or carving. Uh, these could expand service, but currently adoption is still, is still limited uh, for a number of reasons that we hope can be addressed. Um, next slide, please. So another thing that we see in the market is just the affordability. I mean, it's expected that affordability is, is a barrier. Um, there's, there are lower cost components that are available globally, particularly ones that are coming from Asian markets, but the transparency on the quality of these devices is low. Um, and if there's not, if, the, if, if that's not clear, then there's just, there's not trust in that as an option. Um, and so penetrating into LMIC markets is going to be hard. Um, another thing that ramps up prices is just the difficulties in the current supply chain um, network. If we had more responsive supply chan uh, channels that uh, possibly via uh, regional distributors, um, it could help affordability greatly. I mean, currently met most clinicians uh, and workshops in LMICs, they're having to place individual orders with overseas suppliers. And it just, there's no economies of scale being put into place, even on a you know regional or country level. Um, and this would help a lot. Um, a key point that are just very important from, from my mind is just that irrespective of the delivery approach or the supplier approach used, that this human resource capacity is always going to be a limitation. Um, so if we, yeah, if we can explore novel ways of expanding and extending uh, this capacity, um, it could it could result in a greater impact. Uh, next slide, please. So as we look at sort of at these these challenges as a whole, uh, we can kind of we can group them into into three sets. So we've got demand uh, or the perceived lack of demand, which is the, which is truly the problem. Um, supply um, and enablers that that are currently not in place that that could uh, enable improvements in the marketplace. Um, I'll fly through these a little bit. So um, on on this perceived lack of demand, key problem here is just the lack of awareness from different stakeholders, users uh, on what services are available, um, decision makers on what um, the numbers of amputees that they could be helping, uh, and many other points where just this just lack of knowledge uh, is problematic. A major thing that, that results in is just low political will to enact uh, enact and improve the situation. Uh, also, prove, you know, meaning that there's lack of funding, and that means that the out-of-pocket expenditure to the users at the end is often high. And we've mentioned about local cost assists and decentralisation. On the supply side, um, there, there's lots, there are lots of devices available globally, but there is a lack of production product options that are specifically uh, applicable to LMIC settings. Um, there are modular options around, uh, and yeah, but they're, they're generally too expensive um, for the lower markets, unless they ha unless we're dealing with a more of a middle income um, user in whatever setting we're referring to, um, and lack of local supply chains. So on these enablers that could be helping the market here, a key one here is just this no defined, there's no defined outcome measures um, to be playing this back, um, to, be, to be showing the benefits that we could be, we could be developing. Um, there's, we, you know, if there's outcome measures to quantify the economic benefits from prosthetics, it would help. And that, that's not just from the users themselves, but it's also for the wider community, the people that are supporting these people with disabilities when they don't have a device um, that could be, yeah, that could be building the economy in this way. Also assessing performance of new technologies that come through uh, in a clear way. Okay, um, so we move on to the strategic objectives. 
Um, so this first one, I'll linger on this first one just a little bit rather than the other ones, because I really think that this one on data underpins the other four. Um, and it's what improves the, the likelihood of the other four from um, working. Um, it's developing foundational data sets to inform the investment case uh, for services and developing the development of standards. So some key points here, and please do read further in the uh, in the document on this, uh, it's just that again, it's just the lack of data on just understanding how, how amputees are unable to access services um, and what that demand could be. Um, and without such data, just policy policymakers are not going to prioritise investments, and neither are private private investors. Um, more on the product development side, if consensus can be built on what these outcome measures could be to underpin and standardise the data collection that we're suggesting, um, it would help. And also just to guide research and development of, of devices. Um, so the next one, uh, number two, around the governmental level, wanting to support countries to define appropriate policies uh, to invest in the system. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, so number three on innovation. Um, increase in market validation of new technologies, uh, particularly ones that could simplify, decentralize and lower the cost of provision. Uh, number four, around affordability, uh, increasing the uptake uh, of uh, lower cost components uh, by making it transparent uh, of what the quality level of these are um, to empower both the buyers, buyers but also, also clinicians in place so that they can make more informed decisions. Um, and number five, around supply chains. If we want to strengthen that regional mechanisms to improve economies of scale and access to the wide range of components that are needed to suit uh, various users in various settings. Um, great. So that's, yeah, that's it. So thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you very much to Cynthia Liao, who led this work uh, for Chai. Um, yeah, and the wider team that was involved. Thanks so much. Thank you, Ben. Um, that was really fascinating. And I think particularly um, from my perspective, I think it's really interesting just to hear the, the scale, I guess, of, of, the, of the system and all the different elements that feed into that from, I guess, your kind of basic level around kind of a lack of data and the challenges that, that come from that through to the policy and the political will and then right through to the, the product development um, supply and the markets that, that are involved in distributing this, this um, assistive technology to those that need it most. Um, so I think that really kind of summarises just in that product narrative even alone that the, I guess all the different elements that feed into these challenges and, and why um, it's so important to have this kind of overriding documents that really summarise some of um, some of the landscape that, that assistive technology sits within um, and identifies where those changes can happen um, to make the biggest impact. Um, so we're going to go along to questions now. I can see you've had, we've had quite a few come in on the Q&A box, so thank you very much um, for those. Um, but I'm just going to quickly pass over um, to uh, Kathy Holloway, um, just to have any final reflections, I guess, um, across the kind of product narratives as a whole, um, and, 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 and I guess trends that kind of uh, and themes that are appearing throughout some of this research that we're doing, not just on eyeglasses and, um, and prosthetics, but also some of the other product narratives that we've already produced on, on wheelchairs and hearing aids and those coming forward in digital as well. And Ben and Dennis, but um, for me, I suppose data really does underpin everything. Um, it doesn't matter who you're talking to, if, it, if it's a government or if it's UNICEF or um, there's a chat, there's a question in the chat about can somebody help um, get prosthetics to people in Nigeria as they're funding for that, I think it was Nigeria. Um, and the is that we don't know where the need is um, and we don't, don't kind of understand the need. So this. There's the idea of the need being a problem. We all know there's a need, but there's no demand there. And that's the first major thing across any of assistive technologies. There's no demand, there's no functioning market. And that's what Frame's talking about when he, he said about how we need to start, um, I think it was Alison actually said, she used the term market shaping. Um, and, and I think market shaping and market making is what she said. I, I use slightly different language, which is kind of like tilting the playing field. Like there's this playing field and at the moment we need to tilt it to make it a bit fairer. And I think governments um, have a, a huge role to play in that, as well as donors, because we need to we need donors to to continue to fund uh, this space. But we also need to begin to genuinely grow a, a functioning market. So if we want um, entrepreneurs to be able to 
come into this space, they, you know, there needs to be um, mechanisms like tax incentives and, and others to to get people into this space and, and to grow the the um, and, to, and to grow it. And, you know, to, we're all not needing to do this um, anymore. Um, I think the other thing is uh, digital disruption. So we are doing the digital product narrative at the moment, but um, I think you know Ben spoke a bit about it within uh, prosthetics, but I think the same could be true in wheelchairs. Um, digital obviously is, is great for screening tools across uh, eyesight screening and hearing screening. So I think really the kind of digital be more excited to open up to the the Q and A and and hear from um, from some of the many panelists um, and participants. Wonderful. Um, thank you very much, Cathy. Um, I don't know if everyone else is also having a few um, technical issues with a little bit of sound quality and some of the video quality, um, but hopefully um, you're all still hearing us loud and clear where possible. Um, so we thought we'd just start with a couple of questions. So we just thought we'd start with one. I think we just wanted to highlight, um, I guess, in summary of some of these um, narratives, kind of what are the biggest drivers and challenges to implementation? And I guess, what is that next step and what does the future look like? Um, so it would be great to go to Alison, um, just to hear, I guess, your reflections from the strategic perspective of, of, of what are those priorities? Sure, thanks so much. Um, so if I think about um, the country level and go back a bit to some of the themes that I highlighted and have been highlighted by others, uh, you know, I think we need to make sure that we're looking at this um, in terms of how we're implementing some of the different solutions within the broader context and um, situation in those countries. And so making sure that we're bringing together all the relevant groups and having a coordinated approach, not just um, those partners who are supporting an implementation, but making sure that AT users um, and stable persons organizations on the ground, as well as the government are all coming together in terms of the the planning um, for these uh, interventions and um, the actual implementation of them to ensure that there is the right ownership and buy-in and, and coordination, as I mentioned, um, and making sure that uh, within each of the, the pieces that we're doing that we're also providing the right um, information so that there can be these strategic plans and there can be um, an increase in resources providing, I think we heard already about increasing data to have a, a greater investment case. We need to provide um, the information about how um, these different interventions can be really important for the individual, for their families, but also um, that they have benefits um, that are far reaching, uh, you know, economic health and, and social benefits um, for these countries uh, so that we can ensure that everyone really also has um, an understanding of, of why they're doing it and the importance of it so that they can then prioritize it as well. Thank you, Alison. Um, yeah, I think that's really interesting just to um, see that importance on a country level as well as that, as that more kind of international stance as well. Um, Frey, we'll maybe come to you and ask the same question around kind of what are the priorities and, uh, and what do you see those the major challenges but also the next steps being? Perfect and thank you Louise. Perhaps I can link it to another question that I see in the chat box which is uh, developing countries are very slow in assistive technology and how can we boost this and I think at this point I want to uh, make a reference and acknowledge the, the, the great work that was done in recent years by WHO's GATE team uh, to lead the development of a series of different tools that can provide a starting point for countries to increase access to assistive technology. And some of these tools have been developed um, in partnership with other groups here represented on this panel, like UNICEF, um, and a variety of tools are also being developed under the 80-20-30 program. And I think what needs to ha what we're learning increasingly is that one of the reasons why there's a perception of slow action, it often has to do with a lack of clarity and visibility about the current situation as well as the different roles and responsibilities. And by, again, at the same point, uh, convening, the different stakeholders using a, a structured approach to provide the information, provide the facts, provide a framework uh, to them 
which steps and actions can be taken as a starting point for increasing assistive technology, we're increasingly learning that this has promised and been an effective way to make progress. And I think what we need to do now is document those learnings, uh, make those available for others to replicate, but also expand and um, help other countries, help other governments do more um, and help put them in the lead um, for uh, building the foundations and lead the programming. I think it's the only way that much beyond our collective efforts uh, at the country level, uh, things, can, uh, things can also progress uh, uh, much faster. So I hope that's, uh, that helps answer that question. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Frey. Um, and another couple of questions I've seen come through on the on the chat, I think, um, link quite closely to the challenges of um, the kind of supply chains and how um, new products can come in um, and be established in lower middle income countries. Um, so we had one question particularly around, um, I guess, what is the next steps for that? Um, and how can it work? And does it work in terms of creating or using non-certified products or what are the next steps into increasing the number of certified products that are focused on and suitable for low and middle income countries. Um, so Dennis, we'll maybe um, come to you because I think it'd be really interesting to hear just your perspective on, I, I guess, those two areas in terms of what is the priorities in establishing a sl supply chains um, and, and how can we increase the, 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 the opportunities for new products to, to come into those markets? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I am... Um... I think it's important to recognize that there's a, um, I think we all have recognized there's a huge gap between the actual need and the, and the demand that we experience, right? There's a, there's a massive global need, but there's not a huge demand in low, low middle income countries. And I want to echo what came from Alison and Frey that a lot has to do with, um, with political prioritization and, and internal in country mapping of what is already being done. So, um, one thing is uh, is saying that there's no political prioritization, but often it's more is happening in the country than than uh, than what we uh, that what we give them credit for. But it's just uh, a very fragmented approach where there's little coordination of the efforts that is actually being done. So internal mapping would allow us to help the countries uh, build the enabling environments that is required for them to actually start procuring and distributing products. So the enabling, by enabling environment, I mean um, uh, an ecosystem for products that involves everything from uh, screening uh, persons with disabilities uh, to get the right uh, products and the right services. Everything from screening to uh, procurement to logistics to training of staff to um, um, uh, servicing of products, etc. All of that is unfortunately not very present in uh, many low income countries. So even if we were to donate a lot of products to a given country, they wouldn't be able to sustain it or maintain it. Um, so there's a prerequisite for us to help build the uh, enabling environment in low income countries, um, even before we start building the market or uh, at least um, concurrent with us building the market through, for instance, market shaping. So yeah. Internal in-country mapping and ecosystem building is really the next big requirements and it does require political will and involvement. Fantastic. I appreciate that was a huge question, Dennis. I mean, that was a really interesting summary um, just to kind of refine what those are, those real next steps are and, and the priorities. Um, we've also had um, a couple of questions come in, um, particularly uh, for you, Ben, around um, the barriers in stats and data. Um, and a few people asking kind of how, how can we go about increasing those and overcoming the barriers? Um, so increasing the volume of stats and data we're able to collect, um, considering kind of uh, confidentiality and ethics. And, and how do they interplay? Yeah, that's a great. Am I there? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a great question because I mean the problem with you know uh, developing assistive technology um, as comp as opposed to other product development is just that you know when you're doing trials, you're you're, you're really you're you're putting a lot on someone's life for a certain period of time. Um, and yes, that's great if the product's going well, but if it's early stage research, then that's a lot to ask. 
Um, and in certain settings, trying to do no harm during your do while you're doing these studies is needs to be taken into account. Um, I think I think for me on when when we're looking actually rather than the nature of the statistics themselves, um, I think this is why we need a certain you know we want to be developing a consensus on what these on what these data standards should look like. Is that this you know whatever volume of data that you gather. Um, it's not going to be useful unless unless there's there's good comparisons to be able to be made between those data sets, and it's a very hard task. I mean, I think particularly in prosthetics, I think it's a very hard task. Um, the the fitting process itself, um, it's very specific to the individual prosthetist skill level, and trying to make comparisons between different workshops is 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 very hard. But it, yes, it is a hard question, but it's a question that should 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 be answered. Um, so. Yeah, I think that I think for me, really, the, the first stage of that is developing consensus on what the what the correct questions are to be asked and then defining, you know, what those what um, the, the framework of those answers could look like. Um, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Ben. Um, we've also had a couple of questions come through or kind of along the theme of stigma um, and I guess what impact stigma has um, in terms of people uh, sourcing assistive technologies um, but also the awareness um, which seems to be a theme that's come through a, a little bit during today's session as well. Um, so we'll maybe um, come to you Cathy to just get, give a little bit of, of a sense of I guess what importance we can play to can be played to stigma um, within this environment and how um, work around uh, market shaping can impact um, that, that those kind of I just guess cultural intricacies um, that are also at play. Yes, that's not, a, that's not a difficult one at all, Louise, is it? <laughs> it it's very um, stigma and, and negative attitudes in particular towards uh, people who use assistive technologies are, are extremely challenging. And, and some of those are, are very interwoven into cultures, which make it very difficult to change. Um, those cultures are often mostly changed from community leaders helping to influence local groups and people and, and, and also just getting very clear messaging on the fact that, you know, the, the fact that you, you might not have a, a leg or use a, a prosthetic leg or, you, you know, I use eyeglasses. Um, that is, that doesn't really matter. <laughs> it's just a part of who you are. Um, but it is challenging and it's challenging in, in every context. We are doing uh, work with um, Well Told Story, uh, Shazaz now, in Kenya. And they're a, a magazine that reach over half of Kenyan youth. And we are just trying to, in the first instance, just normalise assistive technology use. So in the magazine, uh, the young people, who, you know, stories, the story is not about disability, the story is not about assistive technology, it just so happens that some of the characters um, are disabled. Um, and I think that working with uh, Shazaz was inspired a bit by, um, you know, what happened with GDI Hub came out of the, the Paralympic legacy and, and that really did change um, stigma, changed attitudes in the UK at least. So uh, it changed some attitudes globally, but in the UK, um, it, there was a complete difference while the Paralympics was on. Uh, it, it was amazing. Everybody was happier to start with, um, but people began to value, really value uh, disability and, and disabled people. And I know for a fact that when Channel 4 and, and when the Paralympics, when they got London, when they got the London Paralympics and when they were asked, how they asked how many people would come and watch the Paralympics, um, less than 1% of the UK population said they would watch the Paralympics. And when asked why, they said, well, why would we want to watch people like that? And like that, that's exactly what they said. And they didn't realize that, 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 that um, people who use a wheelchair to get around or people who use prosthetic legs are, are just as brilliant or just as annoying or just as fantastic or as, uh, um, as anybody else. So they went on a huge marketing campaign. And, and that's the other element of, of this. You know, we have to all start marketing at governments, but in our local communities. We have to be like advocates of assistive technology users 100% of the time. We have to get people who influence people to, to talk about assistive technology, just to mainstream the idea. It's just a thing, it's just a technology, and if people had it, their lives would be better, society would be fairer, it would be, you know, that, that would make more sense for us all. And also economies would grow for those that care about the um, econ economics. So, 
I could waffle on this for quite a while, but I think um, I would follow the, um, there's a Sport Against Stigma program within the 80-20-30 program that's been postponed because um, the Tokyo Olympics was postponed, but it will roll out next year and that will get uh, knowledge of um, assistive technology to, to the schools program, uh, working with the Agitas Foundations, part of the International Paralympic Committee and GBI Hub and Loughborough University. So yeah, watch this space, keep checking in with 80 20, 30, and, and let us know what you think. Um, we certainly don't have all the answers. And as Frey said earlier, you know, the World Health Organization has led the way in this and, and we thank Chapal and team for, for helping guide us all. Um, so maybe Chapal could have the answer. He would definitely have a good answer for this. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Kathy. Um, so that brings us near the end of the session today. And I think there's obviously been a, been a lot of questions come through. So thank you so much, everybody um, from right around the world that's joined the session today and put forward all your questions. Um, I'm aware we haven't been able to cover all of them. So we will be um, producing uh, some content after the, the session so we can help cover some of those, but also just provide a bit of an overview. Um, so do keep an eye out on the GDI Hub website for that. And I guess I also just wanted to say that these reports um, were put together in the context of the GDI Hub 802030 work, which is a UK aid funded um, program um, to get assistive technology to those that need it most. And I think the product narratives and the discussion we've had today really showcase the importance of that work and why the right assistive, assistive technology really is our aim and to get it to those people um, in lower middle income countries that currently really don't have access. But actually, as technology moves forward, the opportunities are only growing. Um, and as a community, we have so much potential to, to make impact in this area. Um, so before I wrap up, I just want to say a huge thank you to all the panelists that were able to join us today and our brilliant partners um, from at Scale, um, Chai and, and UNICEF that have worked really hard with us to put together uh, and develop these documents um, and, and also very much kind of looking forward to the future um, as we work together globally and, um, and we really look forward to kind of keeping in touch with you all. I think there's, there's potentially an opportunity for us to do a, a session um, maybe a few months down the line, six months down the line to look at, um, look at some of these areas in a bit more detail as well. Um, so do watch this space. Um, our next Disability Innovation Live will take place um, in October, um, middle of October and that's going to be on inclusive design um, so we'll send you some more information on that as well um, so that's it for today thank you for the panelists thank you to all of you who joined from around the world and um and we look forward to uh, hearing from you soon bye thank you very much